I'd like to welcome you to the launch of Anthea Jeffrey's um, book called Countdown to Socialism, the National Democratic Revolution in South Africa since 1994. My name is Annie Ulifir, and I'm the publishing director at Jonathan Ball Publishers. And an especially warm welcome to the woman and the writer of the moment, Anthea. I'm sure most of you uh, are familiar with Anthea's work and her career, but for those of you who aren't, Anthea is the head of policy research at the Institute of Race Relations, or the IRR, and she is a respected commentator and writer. She has written no less than 11 books, uh, two of which I'm proud to have published, uh, the first being BE Helping or Hurting, and People's, this is just some of the books that she's published, People's War, N uh, New Light on the Struggle for South Africa, that was also published by Jonathan Ball Publishers. So I've known Anthea for nearly 10 years, um, since I published her book on black economic empowerment in 2014, when I was still at Tafelberg Publishers. And it really is a great honor to have published her latest book, Countdown to Socialism. Um, I would just like to say that I know few writers who are as clear in their thinking and writing and who are as meticulous as Anthea. Uh, she is a dream author to work with, and thank you for that, Anthea, really. Um, so I will hand over to her now to discuss some of her key points and arguments in Countdown to Social Socialism. Anthea's incisive analysis of the ANC strategy of the National Democratic Revolution and the impact that it's had uh, on nearly every sphere of life offers a useful and an enlightening explanation of why the governing party rules as it does, or doesn't. So I'm going to show some slides as, as I go through and um, just hope, as Annie was saying, to cast a bit of light on why it is that the ANC does what it does. And I'm going to start with quoting something that's on the back of the book in the blurb, which is really with growth stalling, joblessness at crisis levels, and governance unraveling. Most South Africans cannot fathom why the ANC does not embark on meaningful reform. And we at the IRR address many different audiences all the time, often they're business ones as well, and people often tell us that they're baffled at what the ANC does. Surely, take something like the national health insurance system that's being proposed. Surely the ANC knows this is going to be inefficient, it's going to be corrupt, it's going to cause great harm to many people, and yet they still want to do it. Take expropriation without compensation, EWC. We know it's been a disaster in every country where it's been tried, including Zimbabwe, just to the north of us, and Venezuela, where GDP has contracted by a staggering 70% over the last 10 years, and millions have had to flee. Take something like ESCOM. Obviously, these extended blackouts are crippling to the economy. They're also damaging to the ANC itself because they are making people so angry there's a chance they might vote against the party in 2024. So why, when its own electoral interests are at stake, its grip on power, does the ANC still not embark on reform? And the answer, in a nutshell, is that the ANC is marching to a different drum. We all assume that the ANC wants a thriving private sector in a competitive economy with plentiful jobs and rising prosperity. But the ANC's key goal is rather to take the country from a predominantly capitalist or free market economy to a socialist one. And this is being done, as I write, by means of a National Democratic Revolution, or NDR, which is a Moscow-inspired blueprint for socialist transformation over a long time, over 30 to 40 years. So it's certainly a slow and gradual process but it is nevertheless seen by the SACP, as they constantly say, as offering the most direct route to socialism. And socialism, despite the disbandment of the Soviet Union in 1991, is still the ultimate goal. And one might ask whether socialism still has an appeal after that development. But the answer, I think, became 
clear, perhaps in 1989, there were many people who wanted the Berlin Wall to fall, but there were many other people who thought that it didn't really have that greater meaning for the value of socialism. And it was Joe Slobo who, in the context of that war, asked the key question, has socialism failed? And concluded that it had not. What did he say? That socialism in the Soviet Union had become, and I quote, too commandist and bureaucratic. But that didn't really matter, because that wasn't real socialism. Real socialism is democratic and participatory, and that's what Moscow should have done, but it hadn't even attempted that. And many other commentators have since taken up that theme. And this has been written about, among others, by Christian Niebetz, who is at the Institute for Economic Affairs in London. And he's written a book called Socialism, the Failed Idea That Never Dies, in which he points out that many left-leaning analysts are echoing Joe Slova and saying that it doesn't really matter that close on 100 million people died in the Soviet Union, in Mao's China, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, and so on. Because when we do it again, we'll get it right. That wasn't real socialism, and so it doesn't matter. And so the crimes that are recorded in the Black Book of Communism, which was published in 1999, are really irrelevant. And unfortunately, as the memory of those 100 million deaths have faded, so support for democratic socialism is growing in many Western countries, including the US. And unfortunately, that makes it easier for the ANC to push ahead with, with socialism here. As I have noted in the book, we've been, <laughs> the ANC has been implementing the NDR for close on 30 years. So the process is far advanced. And yet most commentators in the mainstream media and elsewhere largely ignore the NDR. And the late John Ken Berman, who was the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations for many years, made an, a perceptive comment when he said, the commentariat is sleeping through the revolution. <laughs> but given the importance of the media in alerting people to what is happening, it means, unfortunately, that most South Africans are sleeping through the revolution too. And this book hopes to help change that by alerting people to the NDR and its enormous significance. The SACP is the dominant partner in implementing the NDR, and it's long had an enormous influence over the ANC, mostly wielded behind the scenes. And it keeps producing its different programs in which the intention of getting to socialism in the end is always made very clear. In this particular example, the South African Road to Socialism, its 2012 program, it also really boasted about the number of communists it had succeeded in deploying to important positions in government right across the spectrum. So in this document, you have a statement from the SACP saying, since 1994, tens of thousands of South African communists have taken up the challenges of governance as cabinet ministers, members of legislatures, provincial executives, mayors, and councillors. And other cadres, as the SACP adds, have been deployed, I quote, as officials and workers throughout the public service, including the armed forces and the safety and security institutions. And according to the party, it expects all its members, again I quote, to conduct themselves as exemplary communists in these many deployments, whether as ministers, senior civil servants, or public sector workers. And this, of course, is a flagrant abuse of the Constitution, which guarantees open and accountable democracy. The SACP has never stood for national election in its own right and the tens of thousands of communists it has deployed to all three spheres of government generally hide their party membership. And this bamboozles the public and helps conceal the extent of SACP influence in implementing the NDR. But in recent years, the ANC has become more open about its support for the NDR and its reliance on the guidance that the SACP provides. And this was evident, for example, at the SACP's 15th National Congress, which was held in July 2022 at Boxburg on the Eastern Cape. 
and which was attended by President Cyril Ramaphosa, captured their talking to Solima Pala, who is the first General Secretary of the SACP, and looking, one might say, thoroughly at home. Um, and what Ramaphosa said to this Congress was, first of all, how much the ANC values the important bonds between it and the SACP. And Ramaphosa also said, the ANC is determined to defeat each and every effort to derail the NDR, which is the shared program of the ANC and the SACP, and the reason for the existence of our alliance. And what he also said was that the ANC would continue to rely on the SACP as, quote, its intellectual reservoir and the source of the political perspectives and analyses that would guide the ANC going forward. All of which casts doubt, of course, on the very common view that Ramaphosa is a constructive and business-friendly reformist who is being held back simply by the radical economic transformation faction clustered around Jacob Zuma. But this analysis ignores Ramaphosa's own support for the NDR, and it also ignores what he said at another conference held last year. This was the ANC's sixth national policy conference, also held in July 2022. And here, Ramaphosa said, the divisions within the ANC are not divisions about policy or ideology. And he went on to say they are driven solely by the competition for positions and the pursuit of access to public resources. Since actions speak louder than new dawn words, it's also worth assessing the policy changes that Ramaphosa has either adopted or proposed since he became president in 2018. It's quite a list, and these are not business-friendly reforms, but rather interventions helpful to the NDR. And they begin with his support for expropriation without compensation, which he said would help usher in a Garden of Eden. And EWC was, of course, the main element in the draft 18th Constitution Amendment Bills of 2019 and 2021. Those did not proceed, but EWC still features strongly in the Expropriation Bill of 2020 and the related Land Court Bill which is intended to bypass the ordinary courts in all land takings implemented by the state. And then we have the National Minimum Wage Act, which set minimum wages at extraordinarily high levels. We have stricter racial targets under the Employment Equity Amendment Act. We have expanded BEE preferences under the pending Preferential Procurement Bill. We have new race-based quotas for water. We have the NHI Bill. And we have a major erosion of school autonomy coming up under the basic education laws or amendment or ballot bill. Overall, thus, one could say that Ramaphosa has emerged as the most effective RET president of all, given what he has done rather than what he has said. Most of these, is, of these interventions are covered in the book, which deals uh, with 17 different policy spheres in which the NDR is being implemented. And obviously, we can't go into all 17 now. So I thought I'd focus on the three which I mentioned at the start and try and explain how it is, what value those interventions serve from an NDR perspective. As regards the NHI, the NC has helped create the supposed need for this um, by eroding the quality of public health care while pushing up the costs of private health care it has also refused to allow the low-cost options that would make private primary health services affordable to some 15 million more people and so greatly reduce the pressure on the public system. The stated purpose of the NHI is, of course, to provide free and equal health care to all, but generally overlooked are the NDR reasons for the proposed system and the socialist goals it intended to promote. And if we look at those, first of all, a key NDR aim is to socialize the private healthcare sector by requiring it to put people's needs before profits. That may sound admirable to many people, but it will also advance the NDR goal of rolling back the capitalist market by helping to push many private providers into bankruptcy. 
In addition, all private healthcare resources will be brought under comprehensive state control on issues ranging from the fees to be charged to the medicines and other treatments to be provided. Effectively, this will give the government a monopoly over health services. New taxes will also be introduced, very important for the government, and this will be done ostensibly for NHI purposes. But much of the revenue raised in this way is likely to go, of course, to the public service wage bill, to the bailouts for SOEs, and to the general oiling of the ANC's patronage machine. And why do I say that? really because that's what the Constitution requires, though I think many people don't realize it, that when revenue is raised, according to Section 213 of the Constitution, it has to go into the General Revenue Fund and be used for general spending, unless a specific statute is passed to the contrary. And the Treasury has little wish to pass such a statute for the NHI, uh, because, of course, government spending is way beyond government revenue already and it's reluctant to see part of that new revenue go to one specific purpose. As regards EWC, the ANC has also created the supposed need for this by really botching the land reform process. And so we have around 70% of, of land reform projects that have failed, they don't produce as they should. We also have 9.75 million black people who own RDP or other homes, and yet very many of them do not have title deeds. We have 2.3 million black people, sorry, who have benefited from the land restitution program, but none of them has been allowed individual ownership. And we also have a, a large number of beneficiaries of redistribution, but these people are generally turned into permanent tenants of the state with very little prospect of ever owning the land that has been transferred to them as tenants, but not as owners. So against this background, the IRR believes that the key need is to roll out title deeds to all people with insecure and informal tenure. And um, this would help to unlock dead capital and give people ownership of assets that cumulatively would be worth trillions of rands. It's also vital to expand the number of commercial farmers that we have of all races because that would help to build prosperity and increase food security. And instead, the ANC pretends that the best solution is expropriation without compensation. And it also stokes, stokes sorry, racial division by stigmatizing the white minority as land thieves who deserve no compensation. The EWC has devastated Zimbabwe and Venezuela. Many South African commentators persist in playing down the great risks in the expropriation bill which is soon to be adopted by Parliament and which has damaging EWC and other provisions. And they also tend to claim that property rights matter only to the rather few South Africans that have them. But this ignores one of the main messages from a book by Friedrich Hayek, The Road to Serfdom, published in the 1940s, in which he cautioned against the dangers of socialism. And he said this on property rights. The system of private property is the most important guarantee of freedom, not only for those who own property, for, but also for those who do not. It is only because the control of the means of production is divided among many people acting independently that nobody has complete power over us. And he went on to say, if all the means of production were vested in a single hand, whether it be nominally that of society as a whole or that of a dictator, whoever exercises this control has complete power over us. And that, of course, is the ultimate goal of EWC, to give the ANC that kind of power. As regards ESCOM, the ANC has crippled its capacity through cater deployment, through employment equity and job appointments, through preferential procurement and the like. All these interventions have undermined efficiency. They've increased the opportunities for corruption and various other abuses, and they've really made it impossible increasingly for ESCOM to function as it should. If procurement decisions, by contrast, were based purely on value for money, as Judge Zondo recommended in his report, then there would be little scope for grossly inflated prices and contracting and no incentive to sabotage equipment in order to obtain lucrative repair contracts. And of course, all these 
NDR interventions need to be rolled back if ESCOM is to regain its earlier efficiency. But the NC, of course, declines to do this. And former ESCOM CEO Andre de Reta accurately pinpointed the reason for this, not only in his book, but also in his controversial ENCA interview, when he said, unfortunately, the ghosts of Marx and Lenin still haunt the halls of Latuli House. People are still firmly committed to a 1980s style ideology. What he also said is that debating with Marxists is like debating with members of the Flat Earth Society. You cannot win. Despite all evidence to the contrary, they strive for greater state intervention and greater state regulation. And behind all that regulation and intervention lies the most important NDR objective of all. This, as Cassato has pointed out, is to break the power of the capitalist system. Said Cassato in 2018, we need state ownership of all the land in this country in order for the democratic state to break the power of white capital. The reference to white capital is, of course, something of a red herring, intended to make it seem as if the goal is redress and to lull black South Africans into a false sense of security. And why is it necessary to break the capitalist system? Well, think of it this way. If unemployment was below 10%, if the free market economy was thriving, providing jobs, rising incomes, and improving living standards, then people would generally be prosperous and self-reliant. They'd have many options to get ahead outside the state, and little wish to swap a successful capitalist system for a flawed socialist one. And so the most important NDR aim is to cripple the private sector and then blame the resulting unemployment, destitution, and suffering on the supposedly inherent flaws of the free market. People will then have little choice but to depend on state monopolies that are incompetent, callous, and corrupt, but which give a small elite an extraordinary degree of political power and also an extraordinary degree of economic wealth. And here I thought we might have a quick look at Mugabe's palace. Since socialism also brings repression, the destruction of multi-party democracy and unprecedented inequality between the masses and the political elite, it's disturbing that the NDR in South Africa gets so little attention. The NDR is the key to understanding why policies are so destructive Governance is so poor, corruption is so great, and the economy is floundering so badly. It's the key, in short, to understanding ANC rules since 1994, and yet it's largely ignored. That needs to change if South Africa is to avoid the abyss. And so what I hope that this book can help to do is to sound the alarm and build this understanding of what is at stake. I hope that people who read it will no longer be baffled by what the ANC does, but rather forewarned about the grave NDR dangers that we are already in and which lie ahead. Forewarned is forearmed, and South Africans still have the power of the vote. The country's multi-party democracy and largely capitalist economy have been badly damaged over the past 30 years but there's still enough vigor left in both to ask the ANC from power in 2024 and then embark on crucial reforms. And in my view, that a new start might not be feasible is a heady prospect. After more than 40 years of apartheid, discrimination and injustice, and 30 years of NDR damage and deceit. Thank you. And see, you sound very positive that next year already could be that we could get rid of the ANC because we can't actually live with another five years of ANC rule. That damage, how much can they still damage? That the country has to change. You think the DA has got a chance with their moonshot uh, uh, coalition idea? Um, I think it's, it's obviously, as they call it, the moonshot. It's a long shot. Um, I also think that there is a, a degree of, of anger within the, the country that there wasn't before. 
And what is also encouraging is, is the way in which ANC support has been declining at the polls over a number of years, all the way back to 2009, after Mbeki had been ousted. Uh, even then, the number of people who didn't vote was greater than the number of people that voted for the ANC. And in the elections since then, you've seen a steady decline in the number of people voting for the ANC, so that in 2019, it was down to roughly 10 million. Whereas our figures indicate that it was 18 million eligible voters didn't turn out at all. They didn't register, and or if they were registered, they didn't come to the polls to vote. So there's a possibility if there's a significant proportion of those 80 million people can be persuaded that they don't punish the ANC adequately by staying away from the polls, that they need to vote for another party, and that this array of opposition parties, not only the DA, but the various others, give them the opportunity to find one that's a better fit. Um, perhaps that's the advantage of, of what we used to refer to as a wild dog coalition. They might snap and snarl, but each of them offers something slightly different, and yet they also have a, a sort of common core of belief in, in the kinds of policies the country needs instead. So we have a, a chance, but it, it really needs a huge amount of work, determination, and probably litigation to try and get rid of the Electoral Amendment Act, which will give the ANC unfair advantage in a considerable way. Uh, it's a complicated thing, but as I understand it in my simple way, uh, where you have votes for the independent candidates that are either wasted because they don't get enough votes to get a seat or surplus because they get more than they need for a seat. Those uh, votes will tend to be, as it were, redistributed to the larger parties and the ANC is the largest will get the most benefit. So it could end up by winning 51% of the seats on only 45% of the votes and that needs to be challenged and time is running out. Yeah. Hi, Anthea. Uh, David Ansar of the Free Market Foundation. I'm halfway through your book, uh, and uh, it's a riveting read, very comprehensive. Uh, I wanted to pick up on that quote that you shared from John Kane Berman, the late former CEO of the Institute, uh, when he said that the commentariat is sleepwalking through the revolution, or sleeping through the revolution. And I, I wanted to try and understand why that is the case. Why are people reluctant to acknowledge what seems to be uh, before their very eyes. And, you know, I, there was an anecdote about John Kane Berman when he made similar arguments to a business audience and one of the businessmen stood up and said, you're just scaremongering, this is just reds under the bed kind of stuff. And his response was, well, the reds aren't under the bed, they're on top of the political heap. Uh, and so why do you think the commentariat and the general public is so reluctant to acknowledge this fact? I think it really is the commentariat that's the key here. And it's a difficult thing to understand because this is a long-standing issue. If I think about the work that I've done on, on the People's Wall, uh, all the political violence that brought the ANC to power from 1984 all the way through to 1994, with far more violence from 1990 to 1994 than in the early period. And in that subsequent period, of course, there was no need to batter down the door to democracy because the clerk had already opened it. And yet it was then that 15,000 people were killed, as opposed to the 5,000 killed in the earlier period. So you would think there would be a great deal of concern among the political commentariat about why this was so and who was to blame. And instead, though, of course, we had a lot of coverage of the third force role. And of course, there were incidents in which the police in Encarta were clearly to blame for violence. But the bigger picture was the people's war. Part of the People's War strategy is to provoke the police in Ankata into violence. The more extreme, the better, uh, because that helps to discredit them, helps to point the finger at blame at them. It's part of a strategy. So why not look at the bigger strategy, um, of which there was plenty of evidence that didn't suit, uh, that didn't uh, fit the third force theory, including the 400 IFP leaders who were killed, very many of them um, taken out in, in ambushes, shot dead uh, in their homes. So there was a lot of evidence, and, and at that time the media were, were better about covering some of the evidence which, which didn't suit the narrative, and yet it never really got traction. And now we see that even more so now with the NDR, because I think the one thing the SACP has always done is to be pretty frank about its intentions. The trouble is that nobody reads it or takes it seriously, 
because if you do, you can learn a lot about what they plan and then what they do. Um, and I think this media issue is becoming worse in recent years. Uh, the, you know, the lockstep on, and the responses to the COVID lock, uh, pandemic, that lockdown is the answer, the lockstep on the vaccines, uh, the lockstep on, on uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, only one accepted view. We seem to be having our, the range of, of issues about which we can talk, debate, and look at alternatives is, na is narrow. We, we're being fed a narrative all the time that there's only one accepted view, and there are increasingly quite heavy penalties if you go against it. So this is the long march through the institutions, I suppose, uh, a Gramscian strategy that you need to have a great deal of control over the media, um, over the, particularly over the schools and the universities. Um, and it seems to have worked. <laughs> so that it is difficult increasingly for those who don't go with this accepted narrative to have their voices heard. And yet we must do that. And interestingly, ordinary South Africans have not yet been adequately persuaded by what the ANC says. The kind of polling that we've been doing um, over a number of years shows that there's a very strong degree of pragmatism in most South Africans, that they don't want expropriation without uh, compensation, that they think that they would much rather have investment growth jobs than the sort of major redistribution that the ANC holds out as a solution to their problems. Um, they, they haven't drunk the, the Kool-Aid on, on all the race issues as well. And even the, the EFF, uh, Bill Johnson discovered when he asked them the question, they said yes, they'd be willing to give up on EWC if only they could get jobs. So ordinary people are not convinced. It's a narrow political elite which is driving this narrative, driving these policies, which could be halted in its tracks if only we could get enough awareness of the risks and enough awareness that we don't have a radical population champing a bit for more radical policies. We have a pragmatic, often conservative population wanting their needs to be given much greater attention. Thank you. I'll do a little- It has to be easy. I, <laughs> I can't do it. Um, so to piggyback off, off David's question, as a devil's advocate. Suppose um, a proponent of the NDR was here, they might say, you talk about, you quote De Reiter saying, you know, insistence on increasing the size of the state and increasing the amount of regulation. But if we do an international comparison, maybe the sophisticated elites aren't so worried about this because they're worldly. On the worldly scale, South Africa's GDP government spending as a proportion of GDP is middling. It's not extremely high. Uh, France is much higher. France is a much bigger government. The UK has a much bigger government. You started with NHI as an example of what's so terrible about the socialist program. Well, the United Kingdom is socialist in the sense that they have um, a national health service, NHS. Um, okay, so expropriation without compensation is a bit fruity or <laughs> Western Europe, they don't have anything exactly like that. But you know, they had terrible wars and they've, and they've come back from them. And um, some countries, South Korea had a, a, a minute expropriation of our compensation in a sense. And also the, the expropriation of our compensation has been very carefully cabined. It's very difficult to get there. It's, you know, um, the courts will protect you. And it's, it's only in extraordinary cases that that kind of thing is going to happen in the first place. We've abandoned lots of land in the middle of... Uh, the space between Joburg and, and Pretoria. So, okay, it sounds terrible, but if you really get into the details of it, it's not so terrible at all. Uh, really, we just have a government that uh, inherited from apartheid a state designed to cater for a small minority of the population and was therefore relatively small, notwithstanding the excesses of the military. And what's happened, the NDR really just means making South Africa's government more like the United Kingdom's. And here we are in the mother city, uh, what's so wrong about that? Uh, let's all you know, be, be, be jolly glad if we could be more like the UK. How do you, how do you respond to this? Yeah, uh, uh, Christian Nimitz also talks about how uh, support for socialism has grown in the UK. Uh, it's not a good idea there and it's not a good idea here either, but let me try and say more. Um, 
what we are doing is living way beyond our means. We, a country like the UK has a much bigger tax base on which to, to try and ex expand state services, etc. cetera. Uh, we're trying to do this on an incredibly small tax base. We are therefore getting heavily into debt and all the, the consequences that flow from that. And our idea is not just simply that uh, something like EWC will be used rarely. I think this is part of what the commentariat has shown, the idea that it really isn't much of a problem. But uh, we're very well aware that those clauses which allow expropriation without compensation, they list five instances, but they all say this is not a closed list. So you could have many more instances where you have an expropriation with the government taking ownership and not paying any compensation. And that's an extraordinary thing to do. Um, and we can see how badly it has worked in a country like Venezuela, where GDP has shrunk by 70%. What was one of the wealthiest countries in Latin America is now really on the ropes. Um, and we also know on the EWC point that the further intention is for the government to take custodianship. Uh, and it can do that by the stroke of the legislative pen. It tried to do that in 2014 when it put forward a bill saying that all agricultural land would be vested in the custodianship of the Department of Agriculture, etc. It didn't proceed then, but it's likely to proceed in the future. And particularly when it has the expropriation bill in place, because that has a definition of expropriation which is very narrow, and where the assumption of custodianship would fall outside it. And so there'd be no question of compensation being paid. Um, so the, the sort of analogy between us and the UK is a very strained one. What our government is planning to do goes really into the realms of the Zimbabwean and the Venezuelan experiences rather than the UK one. And as I understand it from the UK, they're really in a lot of trouble on the national health uh, system there as well, in terms of the costs of it, in terms of how poor the services are. And here we are also really doing the extraordinary thing that we are going to crush the private sector. And the ANC is really going to try and corral it, say that a private hospital must deal with all patients who come to it at the fees that the, the state sets, as I said. But that means that a private hospital might actually remain solvent for very long. So there'll be an intention to increasingly to take over private resources, use them for the benefit of the state, drive the, public, the private sector out, and then have a complete state monopoly, uh, which will not be any more efficient than the monopoly that we have in ESCOM, Transnet, et cetera. I want to come back, if I may, to the, um, the younger generation, which is a substantial uh, amount of people who didn't go to vote. Or, um, and that if we can convince them that the ANC way is not the right way, nothing means, nothing says that they're going to go to our way. If, uh, with the social media, the internet nowadays, um, it's quite common all over the world, you know, in France, in Italy, in Germany, in, uh, in the state, where these young people don't want democracy anymore, don't, uh, as we love it, uh, our democracy, uh, don't want democracy, don't want institution, don't want the way elections are run. The problem we have is when you ask them, well, what do you want? They don't. I sometimes compare them to the 19th century anarchist who wanted everything out, you know. So how are we going to convince these people, these youngsters? Because you are battling with the social media, with the internet, with the whole world. It's not like it used to be before. You read the newspaper and you had one opinion. Mm -hmm. I think in South Africa, we do still have the advantage of that pragmatic uh, population that I was talking about. And I, I think that obviously the EFF draws its support primarily from young people, but its support has not been growing. It, it seems to have reached a sort of plateau 10, 12%, uh, which is worrying enough in itself, but it is an indication that if people did decide to vote, 
it wouldn't necessarily go for the EFF. Um, so that again is part of the, the battle of ideas which has to be waged and won that uh, this excessive empowering of the state will not have good outcomes. You know, it's, it's so easy, unfortunately, for the ANC to come with a great deal of propaganda. Yeah. I think about what they did on the context of the NHI, where there was also almost a kind of, of um, moral pressure put on people that when they had public hearings, they would bust a whole lot of, of their supporters in and then make it very clear that they were expected to say that they supported the NHI. But they were also told that the only people who didn't support the NHI were the people who were selfish, who wanted to keep just for themselves and not share with others. So that kind of, of moral message will also have some impact on people. And it's very important to be counteracted by the other side of the coin and a picture of Mugabe's palace perhaps quite often, um, because that, as, as we know, is the extraordinary thing. Um, capitalism is constantly criticized for not promoting equality enough, but socialism is far more unequal in its final outcomes between the small political and each, which gets an extraordinary degree of power, quite beyond anything in, in a more democratic system, um, and wealth to go with it as well. Uh, and this is the message that we must constantly put out. Perhaps people need to be told that Chavez, uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela became one of the 400 wealthiest people in the world. Um, that, uh, and this as, as people in Venezuela were literally losing weight because they didn't have enough food. And now I think it's seven million have fled. So there's an important amount of information to be brought out and made available. The, the getting the volume up, getting the spread out, that's a great challenge. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? In an everyday way. I suppose what, what ordinary people can do as much is, is ready to support the organizations that are going out there and trying to fight. Um, obviously, you know, the DA is, is, is an important political party. There are other political parties that are now, we hope, going to play a greater part in the fray. There are any number of, of organizations that do try to bring this message home. Um, and um, so I think in whatever avenues individuals have to talk about it, that's important to do, uh, to contribute to the battle of ideas through the avenues that are being made available. Uh, unfortunately, many in the mainstream media now won't give much coverage to this kind of view. But there are other channels available, and those channels must be used. And they, the social media uh, gives the opportunity for the, this side of the political spectrum also to reach out to a great number of people. Um, so we're not dependent just on the mainstream media. There are other opportunities beyond them. Um, and at the end of the day, it's probably also going to take litigation against some of these bills as they come up. The Expropriation Bill, the Employment Equity Amendment Act, uh, the NHI bill in time, what's the, the legislation that's pending in time to introduce a, a sort of state pension scheme as well and subsume private pensions within that. Resources <laughs> and leadership, we need them both. Thank you. Um, we have a large uh, rural-based voting population. How is it going to be possible to reach everybody who, whose vote counts. I mean, everybody's mm -hmm. vote counts, and it's, um, I don't know, probably I'd say about 40% of the vote in total. Um, how would we get that across to, to people who aren't as, maybe who don't read as much or have the access to the same kinds of um, sources of information that, that we do here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's, 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 it's a fair point. Uh, how do you reach the people in the rural areas? Um, we are, of course, a rapidly urbanizing society as well. So 65, 70% of the population is living in the cities, where it's probably easier for the political parties and other organizations to mobilize and reach them. Um, social media is, again, something that can extend beyond the, the, the city gate. So it needs to be used, and I'm sure that there are young people 
and we have an extraordinary degree of, of smartphone penetration in the country that can be reached in that way. It's getting the right message, trying to, and it has to be both compelling, um, one has to warn what the risks are, and one has to give a sense that there is an alternative available that will work, and it's not an easy challenge. Um, yeah, but it, I think the political parties must all be aware of it, and it is also for them to reach out into these areas. Okay, this is the hard question. <laughs> um, so, I don't know, socialism has a lot of different senses. Um, one sometimes cardinal element is an anti-democratic kind of political elitism, um, which very much seems to be part of the NDR uh, genealogy. Uh, the, the, when you talk about Moscow inspiration, the Soviet Union was uh, anti-democratic in just those ways. Um, I, uh, I've seen polling from the Social Research Foundation to suggest that roughly half the people in KZN uh, wouldn't mind uh, that province becoming a new country. Um, and I imagine the figures are relatively similar in the Western Cape. And that's probably already largely because of a sense of frustration at the NDR, not necessarily connecting those dots, but feeling that force. Um, my worry is that governments that can't protect property rights seldom protect free votes and that uh, we'll have a free, free and fair election next year, but maybe not in 2029. Mm. Um, once you've added an expropriation without compensation regime to stolen, to stolen presidential elections, stolen parliamentary elections, um, the, the case for, for a violent split of South Africa will seem quite legitimate to a lot of people. Um, does South Africa survive as one country uh, mm. under the NDR is my question. Yeah, no, that is a hard question, <laughs> particularly because I've never given it particular thought. Um, I think obviously that the fissures are there and there are many people who would like to be able to withdraw from this failing state. Um, at the lowest level, there's a great deal that's very constructive things that, that can be done and are being done by people sorting out their own problems, whether it's potholes or uh, street lights and so on. But the bigger question will the Western Cape try to secede? I think under the ANC, very unlikely. Will the IFP try to secede? Um, I think they would always say, um, from what I recall when I was writing earlier books, that they wanted a great deal of autonomy, but they did also still want to be part of South Africa. Um, so maybe what one can do is increasingly uh, use what few opportunities there are in the Constitution to devolve power down, um, to start, uh, you know, the Western Cape, for example, has just introduced collaboration schools, and there was an attempt to stop that uh, with a court case, which I understand it has failed. Um, so. It's, an, it's a, a small initiative, but it indicates that you don't always have to march to the drum that the century is beating. You can start doing other things, and we must just hope that some of the best ideas for building the power of the private sector, limiting the power of the state, uh, that different parts of, of the country will start to do these things. Um, if if KwaZulu Natal were to come under the power of the IFP again, then it would have more opportunity to implement a different schooling system, a more effective one. So I'm not sure I'm really answering, but I think that the risk of, of, of diverge of a split is considerable. All the money, of course, is collected in the center and distributed from there. So dealing with the money is not an easy issue. Um, but perhaps again, at the end of the day, it's, it's part of the, the, the battle of ideas to say that there was pressure for many years for a federal South Africa. Um, and that's what was forgotten in the sort of rush of the negotiations process. Very much it was part of what the NC was determined to prevent. A federal South Africa would not have allowed the NDR, um, even though it had a lot of support. So to go back to the federalism idea without breaking up the country, but making sure that there's much more autonomy within the provinces to do things differently and better. Uh, I think one, one aspect which does not seem to, to be covered 
in the commentariat or, or anywhere that I've seen, the, the assumption seems to be that, that we, in a, a stable state there will always be the minorities and the capitalists. Perhaps the way to, to get at these 18 million people is to say that the, the minorities, the white, and, and in fact the, 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 the colored and the Indian minorities, and in fact the black intellectual minorities, also a minority class, they're leaving the country. It's quite likely that by 2050, whites will be a trace element like in Kenya. And I think that, in a way, turns the whole debate on its head because if, if you assume a static situation, the whites are always there, we are always here, it's a zero-sum game, let's take from the whites. If you realize the whites are going for all kinds of reasons, not so much affirmative action empowerment, more crime and more huge attraction from the aging West. The West is running out of young talent. There's a massive efflux. If, if you change the dynamics around and say, you don't have to like the minorities, and, but the minorities, because of the sin of apartheid, if you think the minorities have taken all the wealth, it's in the head, they've taken all the wealth, and they're going to leave with it. What you should do is drop all the racial engineering and, and the racial targets and things, set the minorities free to make the country use the wealth that they've stolen, give, give that wealth back into a much bigger economy with a much bigger tax base, and you'll inherit the whole lot in 2050. The, uh, I mean, the, the, they'll be gone. But, but you'll have all the wealth at the moment, you're getting nothing. You're letting them sit with the wealth, you're marginalizing them, trying to push them into 10% of the economy, and you're just being completely stupid. Um, again, I'm not really sure how best to answer that, but one of the things that struck me as you were speaking is that I think the real minority is the ANC group of people, the activists who attend the national conferences every five years, and who embraced the NDR and then set it in motion for the next five years. Because they, what they want is completely at odds with most, most South Africans want, of all races. And we've seen that in our polling. And the polling has also shown, as I indicated, that, that there's not a great hunger to uh, redistribute. There is a great hunger for investment, for jobs, and so on. I, and again, to quote um, Bill Johnson's research, which he did in 2017 when Cyril Ramaphosa was, was uh, stat, um, vying for the presidency against Nkosuzana, Lamini Zuma, he found that there was enormous support for, for Ramaphosa, mostly because people believed that he would usher in business-friendly policies. That means they didn't understand his support for the NDR, but that was the way he'd been spun and people liked that message. They really liked the idea of the business-friendly policies, the jobs, the investment that they hoped you would bring. And they, they didn't want to see South Africa descending into a sort of racial conflict um, in which there's uh, the, the key issues who can take what from whom. So yeah, I, I think that it's obviously the sensible thing is to use all the skills that the country has. It's absolutely bizarre that we don't do that. Um, Beginning with ESCOM, if we used all the skills the country had, then there would be more people available to mentor the young engineers coming in. You've got all the theoretical knowledge, but not enough of the practical experience. Um, so, and I think most South Africans get that. In our polling, again, it shows that they want black and white to work together for the benefit of all. Um, so we can tap into a deep well of, of support for that idea and make it very clear <laughs> that the minority that needs to be isolated is that, that activist RE, you know, ANC minority, completely out of touch with the wishes of the great majority. Thank you, Anthea. Wonderful talk and a wonderful book. I'm halfway through. I wouldn't say I'm enjoying it, but I'm... I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm it's, I thought I knew everything. I obviously didn't know half of what's going on in the country. Here's a, a puzzling question to me. You speak socialism, communism versus capitalism. All around the world, without exception, there are no exceptions. 
ordinary people, working class people, always, always want to move from a communist country to a capitalist country and never the other way around. Mm -hmm. From, from East, uh, socialist East Germany to capitalist West Germany. From, from uh, uh, North Korea to, to South Korea and from Cuba to over and over. There are no exception the other way around. But what a lot of those people do, flee from socialism, at the next election in the, in the capitalist country, they vote for a socialist party. Mm -hmm. And you find all around the world, although capitalist communism proved an absolute total disaster, especially for poor working class people, there's, there's flourishing communist parties all around the world. As far as I know, in the whole Western world, I don't know one single major party with the word capitalist in it. Can, mm -hmm. can you explain? It's almost as if capitalists are ashamed of their own success. Yeah. Business people seem very different and ashamed. Uh, can you mm. give any insights into this? Yeah, I, I think that it's, you, you're right. You highlight an important issue. And I think what has happened in the last uh, more than 30 years now, when uh, the Berlin Wall came down, when the Soviet Union disbanded, um, I think there was a a kind of great sense among many Western countries, well, we won, now we should help Russia to get back on its feet again and become part of the Western democratic world. But I also think that there was um, the, the disappearance of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union did not have put an end to the Communist parties in all the other countries or the Socialist parties in other countries. And, and I think that they have all benefited from, as it were, you don't have the communist bogey in the Soviet Union anymore. So the, the black book of communism can now be written off as rather irrelevant because that was then and this is now. And we're going to have this democratic participatory real socialism in the future. And I, I think there also has been something of, of a shift of strategy um, that in many countries, left-leaning people have really gone for a more Gramscian approach um, where the emphasis is on taking over the institutions, on the culture war, on, criti on critical theory, particularly critical race theory in the US and elsewhere, um, which is really now sort of coming into focus, this, this idea that you have the oppressors and the victims and that the only solution is for the victims finally to overturn the system of the oppressors, which sounds very Marxist, um, but it's, it, it's taken us a while to come back to, to where Marxism would have felt comfortable using the proletarian against the capitalist analogy. Um, so again, I think the, the commentariat has a lot of a big role to play in that. We've heard nothing about what's wrong with communism for a long time. Yeah. There were not trials at the end of, of the Soviet Union. There was no equivalent of Nuremberg. Um, and uh, I think that School children are, are, are led to, are given quite a good understanding of the Nazi horrors, but not a good understanding of, of, of Soviet and communist horrors. And at the same time, capitalism gets bad press over and over again, that it's all about the, the greedy uh, corporations, that it's all about inequality, that it's all increasingly about the destruction of the environment, and, and that the only right and proper solution is to uh, reject capitalism and go for participatory democratic socialism. Uh, so it, it's part of, of the challenge now because the media uh, doesn't, doesn't really um, look critically at, at uh, communism. I was interested yesterday watching um, BBC. They talked about a British, uh, sorry, an American soldier who'd gone by mistake probably into North Korea. But was there any description of well, how, what dreadful things might happen to him in North Korea? Just we are worried about him. Whereas we'd had endless coverage before on, on some of the media kind of uh, bugbears. Um, I, I think there's, we face a, a, a very difficult challenge because it's not just in South Africa, it's in many other countries that socialism has been, as it were, kind of given a gilded, it, it's, faded out of sight, to the extent that it's talked about at all, it's seen as irrelevant, and capitalism is constantly given a bad press. And that's part of the challenge to show that that is just not the way it works. 
And there is really good information in the Economic Freedom of the World reports, for example, that show that in economically free countries, the, uh, everybody does better, including the poorest 10%. And that, those sorts of statistics need to be top of everybody's minds and to know that they got that through competitive businesses and uh, the innovation that they stimulate. Well, let, let, let's say one thing could put the whole thing in perspective. My, my father was at Cambridge in 1957, and he, he attended a lecture by John Maynard Keynes. Now, this has never been reported, to my knowledge, in any media. And they were discussing capitalism and communism, and Keynes said, the advantage of capitalism is it disperses power all over society, and communism concentrates power in the same hands. And in a way, that, that's all you need to say. Everything else flows from that. Absolutely. And you know, I, I quoted Christian Nemitz's book, and he has a quote in that saying, um, it's an extraordinary degree of power. Once you've given the, the state this control over the means of production, et cetera, et cetera, it becomes the landlord, it becomes a financial intermediary, it becomes the employer. It has power in every sphere of life. And in a capitalist country, obviously, uh, there's, there's no entity that has that degree of power. It's a degree of power which is quite of a different order. And I think people have difficulty in grasping just what a different order it is. Thanks again to the team from Exclusive Books for hosting us tonight. We really appreciate you having us. And yes, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for coming. <laughs>